Now that I've defined the determinant and shown how to calculate it, in this video I want to talk about the properties of the determinant. I'm not going to go into proofs in this video, but all of these properties of course have proofs, and several of these proofs are interesting pieces of mathematical reasoning. The first and most important property is how the determinant interacts with matrix multiplication. So let A and B be two n by n matrices. These are both transformations of Rn. I can compose them. AB is the composition, doing B first and then A. What is the determinant of the composition? Well, it's the product of the two determinants. If, for example, B multiplies area by 3, and then A shrinks area by 1 quarter, the total result of that area is the change by the product, 3 quarters. This is a very convenient property. Matrix multiplication is the way that transformations fit together, and determinants show how these transformations affect, affect space, so I can put these together and determinants work nicely with composition of matrices. Now let me assume that A is invertible. What is the determinant of the inverse? Well, if A doubles area, then A inverse should probably multiply area by a half, since doing A and then its inverse should get back to where we started. Since the effect on area is multiplicative, the inverse should have the reciprocal effect. And indeed it does. The determinant of the inverse is the reciprocal of the original determinant. In particular, this means that a matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is not zero. I haven't talked about much about zero determinant so far, but let me do so now. A zero determinant means that all size is multiplied by zero. This means that size is destroyed. The only way to do this is some kind of projection, flattening everything down to a lower dimension, and this will destroy the ambient notion of size. If all of R3 is flattened down to a plane, well, there is no more volume of any kind to talk about. Before I said that matrices were invertible if they didn't involve any kind of projection. Well, that's what's being said here. Determinant not equal to zero means that size isn't destroyed. It might increase or shrink, but it never entirely disappears. No kind of projection is possible, and therefore whatever happens can be reversed. The inverse of the transformation can be defined as long as the determinant is non-zero. This lets me add to the list of properties of invertible matrices that I used before, and here is that total list so far. An n by n matrix is invertible if any of these equivalent statements are true. It has rank n, it row reduces to the identity, the kernel is zero, the image is all of our n, the columns are linearly independent, the rows are linearly independent, and now the determinant is non-zero. This also means that A equals uv has a unique solution u for any fixed v in the target. That is, any system with matrix A will have no free variables and will lead to a single solution. Here are some more properties of the determinant. Again, let A, B be n by n matrices, and now let alpha be a scalar. The determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. That was a pro property from before. Since numbers are commutative and determinants are just numbers, this means that the determinant of either order of composition is the same. A, B, and B, A are usually not the same transformation, but they will have the same effect on size and orientation. If I multiply a matrix by a constant, that is, every single entry in the matrix is multiplied by alpha, the effect on size is multiplying by alpha to the n. Hopefully this makes a little sense. In R2, multiplying all entries by alpha is scaling both x and y by alpha. The change in area is alpha squared, not just alpha. And the same holds for higher dimension, volume changes by alpha cubed, and so on. Finally, let me talk about row operations. It's an interesting question to think about how the determinant interacts with the row reduction process. There were three operations, switching rows, multiplying a row by a constant, and adding one row to another. Switching rows introduces a negative side to the determinant. Multiplying a row by a number alpha also multiplies the determinant by that number alpha, which fits the discussion I just had about scaling directions. Finally, and most surprisingly, adding one row to another has no effect on the determinant. 
And all this together actually gives another way to calculate determinants. I could just keep track of the switches and multiplications in the row reduction and put all those together to get the determinant of the matrix.